Exodus chapter number 33. I'll begin reading in verse number 10. Uh, certainly you are aware of what is going on in Scripture. Uh, Moses is the leader of God's people. The, God's people have just once again rebelled against God with the golden calf. And uh, they have been rebuked by that. God is very angry at them. But then I want us to see in verse 33, in, in verse number 10, And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but a servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also, for thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me. And thou shalt stand upon a rock. This morning, I want to look at that phrase, there is a place by me. And I want to put some attention on that phrase right there this morning and also look at this text and see a progression, some things that I observe that reminds you and I this morning that there is a place by God. Aren't you thankful that because of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have access to the throne of God? Aren't you thankful for God's blessings? Aren't you thankful for God's provision? Aren't you thankful that we have a God who sits on His throne this morning? We can say to Him, can we see Your glory? Father, I pray this morning that You would bless Your Word. I pray that You'll bless Your people this morning. Father, our nation does not need a political revolution. It needs a spiritual one. And Father, may we be reminded this morning of the role your people play. May we be reminded this morning that we have an almighty God who still does miracles. We have an almighty God who still blesses his people. And Father, I pray your will will be done today. I pray your work will be done. I pray hearts will be encouraged and challenged and convicted. And may someone who is unsaved today hear the gospel and may they trust Christ as their Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is one of those passages of scripture that every time I think about it, it stops me in my track. It is very convicting to me as I think of these words, there is a place by me. Imagine with me just for a moment this scene as God is talking to his man Moses. And Moses, through the course of Scripture we read, comes to the place where he says, God, show me thy glory. God's response is, there is a place by me. Imagine that. Imagine Moses in that conversation, hearing those words from God. And we know the story, how God reminds him that no man can see me in all of my glory. No man can see me as you're asking, but I'll let you get a glimpse of my glory. And aren't you thankful that every now and then, God gives us a glimpse of His glory? Gives us a glimpse of who He really is? Friend, how wonderful heaven's going to be. We're going to get to see God in all of His glory, all of His magnificence. But I think of that scene, the, the, the place by God, the glory of God. I think, what a glorious place. What a prestigious place. There's no greater place of honor than by God. What a secure place. There's no place more secure than in that place by God. 
Sadly, as I think of this place, I think it's an uncrowded place. There's a lot of people who would say, I want to see God's glory, but they don't want to know God in a way where they can see His glory. We don't just walk into the presence of an almighty God who placed the stars where they are, who named the stars, who created all things, and demand that He show off for us. Sadly, most will never have a close, intimate relationship with God as they could have. We know Moses knew God. And as I look at this passage of Scripture, there's some things that I would like to share with us today and put our attention on that I believe will be a help to us. We see, first of all, in verse number 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. We find, first of all, obvious fellowship. Aren't you thankful that we have a God that you can fellowship with? Aren't you thankful you have a God that we can reach out to? And we can, we can make our petitions known unto Him. And we can ask for His intervention. But isn't it wonderful just to have a friend that you can talk to when you can't talk to anybody else? This was not the first time Moses had talked to God. God describes to Moses in this passage of Scripture, He records for us His relationship with Moses. God has said... That's my friend. God has preserved. Moses and I talked face to face as a friend speaks to a friend. Now, I don't know very many people here, but there's a few people I know, and when I saw them this morning, I didn't have to introduce myself to them again. I didn't have to remind them of, of where we met each other because we have a friendship, we have a relationship. It shouldn't be that way with God either. God, remember me? It's been a while since I've seen you. Moses was a friend. I want to confess something to you this morning. I, I want to be a good pastor of my people. I want to be a good preacher that brings honor and glory to God. I want to be a vessel in His hand, but... Can I say to you, the longer I'm in the ministry, the longer I'm saved, i, I got to confess to you, I just want to know God as Moses knew God. Yeah. I want to be able to talk to my God as a friend yeah. speaks to a friend. Sure. I want to be able to stop in the middle of the day and as I would pick up a phone and call a friend and, and just chat with him, I want to just stop and say, God, can I just talk to you for a little yeah. bit? Yeah. I just want to tell you what's going on in my life as he doesn't already know, but I'd like to talk to you about that. And yeah. Moses knew God right. as a friend. You know what we need in our churches? You know what we need in our nation? You know what we need in our Christian homes today? Is we need God's people to know God in a greater way. I'll make another observation. We find complete reliance on God. In verse number 15, And he said, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. I think sometimes, and, 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 and I understand why we say this, say, uh, I want to go somewhere, and I want God to go with me. But really, we ought to be wanting to go where God's wanting to go. We ought to be wanting to do what God's wanting us to do. And before Moses could say, God, show me thy glory, he had to know him face to face. He had to have complete dependence on God. The last year or two has been kind of an interesting year in all of our lives, in our nation, the things that have gone on in our world, those who have had a reliance on someone other than God have been in great trouble. I think we have been reminded, we know this, you can't rely on the White House no matter who's in there. You can't rely on a Congress, no matter whether it's Republican or Democrat. You can't rely on the governments of this world. You can't rely on them. We must have a reliance on God. We must have Him involved in what we are doing. And Moses says, I know these are your people, and I know there's a place you want them to go, but God tell me now whether you're going to go or not, because if you're not going, I'm not going. If your presence isn't moving forward... I'm not moving forward. Remember, the people had sinned. 
The people had tried to, to bring back the gods that they left behind in Egypt. And, and now Moses is saying, well, just let me know now because if you're not moving forward, I'm not moving forward. And you and I must have a complete dependence on God, complete reliance on Him. One of the most frustrating and the most difficult things I've faced as a pastor is when God says, just sit there for a little bit. Just endure. Just, just, just take it. Just, 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 don't, don't, I, I know you want to get up and go, but, but, but just sit there. And old friend, it's, it's a bad thing when we get ahead of God. And then I want us to see, thirdly, and this is where I want to spend most of the remainder of my time, we see an, an established role and an expectation. Notice with me in verse number 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. What is God speaking about? This is an answer to, Mo to Moses' petition in verse 13. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this, is, this nation is thy people. Now, as you, as you read this chapter, this passage of Scripture, Scripture tells us that Moses is meeting with God, and all the people worship in their tents. The previous chapter, as you know, we've already mentioned, God's people had set up that golden idol. And they had chosen to worship that instead of worshiping the God who had delivered them from bondage. So, in, in essence, God has told Moses, said, tell everybody to go to their room. They're in their tent. Moses is meeting with God. God, Moses has said, tell me now if your presence is going to go forward. Are these your people that you said you were going to establish? This conversation is following Moses' intervention when God wanted to destroy the people for the golden calf. Moses intervenes on behalf of the people. Notice what God says in verse 17, and this is, this is so critical. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. God tells Moses, I'll do what you've asked. I'll show grace, not because of my people, but because I know thee by name. Those people were spared the judgment and wrath of God because there was a man who knew God face to face. Those people were spared the chastisement and judgment and destruction by God, which they had earned because there was a man who knew God face to face. He said, because I know thee, thou hast found grace. Oh, when we listen this morning as we see the pattern that Moses has set in Scripture, Moses had God's ear and his role was established, he would be that one that would intervene on behalf of the people and say, God, let me remind you of your promise. Let me remind you of the imperfect people. Let me remind you of your grace and your goodness. And I petition you, I beg you, I stand between you and them. And because God knew Moses, he said, because I know thee. We do a lot of complaining in our nation, and rightfully so. But I wonder, and I think we know the answer to this, but I think the judgment of God can still be spared. America has earned God's judgment. In my personal opinion, if you have a different one, that's okay. I, I, we can still get along on this, but uh, my personal opinion is the things that have taken place in our government is God's judgment. We have the president today we deserve as a people. Does that mean that our nation is through? Does that mean that, that, that God is going to pour out His wrath? Perhaps, but I wonder. 
If there are some people who know God face to face, can they not intervene between God and a nation and say, God, let me remind you of your mercy. God, let me remind you of your grace. Let me remind you of the remnant who still looks to you and still who knows you and still who wants to move forward by your grace. What we need today is we need some preachers who, as we've already heard and we'll hear today, who unashamedly stand and proclaim the truths of God's Word. They're not worried about popularity. They're not worried about what is relevant as far as the world is concerned, but they're only worried about what comes out of this book. What we need is we need the same preachers before they get up and they proclaim the truths of God's Word. To talk to their friend. And on Monday, after the Sunday, the Lord's Day is by, to say, I just want to talk to my friend today. And I want to intervene on behalf of my people. God, I want to talk to you about brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. And I want to talk to you about what's going on in their life. And, and, and they're not doing well. And, and, I, and I know the situation, but God, could you not have a little more mercy? Could you not have a little more grace? And it's my prayer that as God looks at Jacksonville, Florida and the Emmanuel Baptist Church there, that maybe God would have some grace and mercy because He knows a pastor face to face. He knows him in an intimate way and it's not a first time that he comes calling upon him but say, God, would you grant some mercy? Would you grant some grace? There's a prodigal out there and I know they've earned your judgment. I know they've earned your condemnation. But would you grant them some mercy? Because you know me. May God prolong and grant the mercy our nation deserves because there are some people who've decided to know him face to face. We need parents who would do the same for their children. As I've pastored going on 10 years now, been in ministry more than 20 years. One of the most heartbreaking things I've had to deal with is parents weeping over their prodigal children. But oh, if some parents would get a hold of this and say, God, I know they've earned it. I know they've turned away from your truths. And I know what your book says and the, and the chastisement and the judgment. Would you just prolong your judgment just a little bit longer? Would you just keep your hand back just a little bit longer? And oh, as we pray through those lost loved ones and those that we know who have never trusted Christ as their Savior, may we pray for the grace and mercy of God. God, would you send somebody into their life that would give them the gospel? Would you bring somebody into their world that would be the light of gospel to them? Oh, if grandparents would get to know God in such a way that they could intervene on behalf of their grandchildren. If Christians would know God in such a way that they could intervene in behalf of their nation. And friend, this morning, I'm all for you voting. You ought to vote and put the sticker on your chest, but get in your prayer closet and ask for God's, ask for God's grace and God's mercy and to hold His hand in judgment back so that we can have a space of grace. Would a friend know God in such a way that they could intervene on behalf of a friend. God says, because I know thee. I wonder how many lives have been spared because God knew of thee. I wonder how many prodigals have had a chance to come home because God knew thee. I wonder how many revivals in past have taken place because God knew thee. We don't know who is responsible for God. America has earned the judgment of God. Just for the abortion issue alone, America has earned the judgment of God. And now to make a mockery out of the genders in marriage, America has earned the judgment of God. Could we not know God in such a way? We'd say, God, would you hold it off just a little bit longer? 
Would you, would you spare just a little bit longer? I want my children and my grandchildren to have that space of grace where they can know you and they can see your hand and they can see what you would do. And friend, this is the answer I believe to our nation is for some Christians to get on their face again and say, every day I'm showing up because I want to know you, God. I want, I want to live after you, God. And then I conclude with this obvious point when we come to the life of Moses. He says in verse number 18, after there is obvious fellowship, after there is complete reliance upon God, after there is an established role and expectation, there is a desire to see and know God more. He said, in verse 18, he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Moses, like few who have ever lived, had seen the power of God. Think about this. He knew what it was like to have a rod and watch it turn into a serpent. He knew what it was like to see the Red Sea part and walk on dry ground. He had seen the power of God like few have ever seen it. He had seen the protection of God like few had ever seen it. He had seen the provision of God in, in, in every morning as God would drop that manna and God would give water out of a rock and God's people didn't always know how they were going to eat. They didn't know whether they were going to get water but they watched God provide for them over and over and over and over again. But yet Moses was not satisfied with what many Christians are satisfied with. Truth of the matter is, God shows us His power and we don't deserve to see it. I can think back in my lifetime and I've seen God do some amazing things. The miracles are not from days gone by. We live in the days of miracle because we have a living God. We've seen His power. We've seen His protection. We've seen His provision. But do we want to know God in a greater way? I don't ever want to get satisfied with just saying God got in on this. I don't ever want to be satisfied with seeing a miracle that God has done. I want to see the miracles. I want to be in meetings where the power of God is evident. I want when people walk in the parking lot of the Emmanuel Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, I want them to feel the presence of God. I want them to leave the church house on Sunday knowing they've been in church. But I want to know God in a greater way. I have to confess my heart to you this morning as a younger preacher. I was just concerned with watching God work. Boy, look what God did today. And don't get me wrong. I'm not taking that for granted. The fact that God would ever meet with us ought to drive us to our face and to give God the glory. Boy, I was consumed and concerned with God's protection and God's provision and how He provides. But I want to know God in such a way that it's just a natural progression. I've seen you face to face. We have that relationship. I, I, I'm going only if you go. And God, once again, I'm coming to you on behalf of your re rebellious people and, and reminding you of your goodness and reminding you of your grace. I don't want to just be satisfied with that. I, wanted to, I want to know you in a greater way. I don't know if anyone... We find in Scripture, God says, I know Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. What a testimony. What a testimony. I happen to think that means more to Moses than the fact that he could part the Red Sea. Moses said, I know you. I've seen your power. I've seen your protection. I've seen your presence. But God, I'd like to see a little bit more. I'd like to know you. I'd like to see your glory. I want to see more of you. And oh, it would be a wonderful day in our life when we can rejoice in the power, we can rejoice in the protection, and we can re rejoice in all of those things, but say, that's not enough. 
Because God, I don't want to. I don't want to just see your power. I don't want to just see your protection. I don't want to just just eat the food that you provide for me. I want to be able to look past all that and see there's a God who bestows these things upon me. There's a God who's worthy of my worship. There's a God who's worthy of me wanting to know you in a greater way. And I've seen your power, and I've seen your presence, and I've seen your protection. But I know there's more. Show me your glory. And the Lord's simple response was, there is a place by me. I know it's 2021 and the world's coming to an end. But can I make a declaration this morning? I believe there's still a place by God. And I rejoice in His power. I rejoice. I could testify all day of His provision, His protection, His power. But when it's all said and done, May we have a desire to know God in a greater way. God, I want to see in your glory. God, I want to see who you really are. God, I want to see more of you. And obviously on this side of eternity, He can't show us because no man can see Him as He is. But He does say, there's a place by me. Who wants the place by Him? It begins with, I want to know you face to face. Father, I pray that our desire will be to know you in a greater way. Father, I thank you for bestowing upon us your power, which we're so unworthy of. Father, I thank you for your protection. All the, the enemies of Satan are about us this morning and they're more active than they've ever been and they're seeking those who would stand and proclaim and, and remain as we heard last night. And Father, I, I thank you for your protection. But God, or we would all be destroyed. God, I thank you for your provision and so much in our lives we take for granted we, do, we would not enjoy but for the hand of God. Father, I thank you for just being you. And Father, may our desire be today to discover that place by you. And may we see you as we've never been able to see you before. Bless these dear people. Bless this pastor of this church. May your will be done, for it's in Christ's name. Amen. Proverbs chapter number 30, and I'm going to start reading with number 24. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make their houses in the rocks. <clears throat> the locusts have no kings, yet they go forth of all of them by bands. <clears throat> The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Pastor Weaver, would you care to uh, bless the message, please? Father, I pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord. Be with us in Jesus' name. God, help us, Lord. You read the Bible, you'll see that Jesus a lot of time in the gospel would use parables and he would speak figuratively uh, concerning the thing because to get people to understand better. Preachers use illustrations to get you to understand. If you illustrate it on one thing concerning another thing, it helps you understand what they're talking about. And uh, so there's a lot of places in the scriptures uh, that uses that type of thing, and I believe that's what God's word is doing here. It's speaking in figuratively, 
hallelujah, figuratively. <laughs> I mean, my I'm kind of tongue-tied, but hey, listen, when you get you some tushes, I mean some brand new teeth, <clears throat> <clears throat> then that's a different ball game. <laughs> if it wasn't for my chin bumping my nose, I'd take my teeth out. Listen, in Proverbs chapter 30, we can see some of these illustrative verses to teach us a few things. And the Bible says in verse 25, in verse 25, the ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in summer. Well, I believe that's speaking to us of the physical person. Now listen, I was raised up in, on the farm and out in the country, and in the summertime you got blackberries that comes in season, and you got corn and beans and all that stuff, and hey, listen, I like it, boy. You can look at me and say I like to eat, but now we do that in the summertime, put up for the wintertime so you have something to eat when it's cold. Now the ants, you can learn that, you know, the Bible teaches us that if a man don't work, he shouldn't eat. So we can learn something from a little bitty ant. And there's a lot could be said there. And I know uh, a lot of preachers uh, preach on that, and, and I like it. I like it. But we can learn from the ant. Then we see in verse 26, we see the, the conies. And uh, the conies are but a feeble, they're weak within themselves, but yet they make their houses in the rock something solid, something secure. They're not able to defend themselves, but they make their houses in the rocks. And I, I believe that can speak to us about the spiritual things. We're weak in ourselves, <clears throat> and we can't do much within ourselves. But I'm going to tell you what, listen, if we'll just plant ourselves in the rock of Jesus Christ, he said, upon that rock, when you acknowledge him as the Savior, the Son of the living God, we're in the rock of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Then we see the locusts. In verse 27, the locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. They stick together. They assemble together. And that speaks of the assembly. Man, I tell you what, you know, one can chase a thousand. Hey, but what if four or five gets together? And folks, on and on. And then we see it, the spider. Hey, the, the, and the Bible says in verse 28, the spider take hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. In king's palaces, well, I believe that speaks of the house of worship. We built a new church, and it's going to be dedicated the 27th of August unto God, unto the Lord. Man, he's the one that gave it to us. And it's Jesus Christ. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But the other day, I was in the hallway in the church, and I seen a spider. I thought about this verse. Dwelling in the, I said, I'm going to leave him alone. I'm going to leave him alone. I ain't going to stomp him, kill him. I'm just going to leave him alone. Hey, we would be wise to follow the examples of the ants and the conies and the locusts and the spiders. They're little, but they're wise. But as I thought on the little things that we just overlook a lot of times, we can learn from them uh, we can, because they, there's something valid in each and everything. There's a whole other world of microscopic uh, creation that God created that we just take for granted. Don't even know that they're there. As I thought about this, how God uses different things to illustrate truths to his people, little things but wise. With the Lord's help, me being a country boy, hey, I want to talk about another little thing. I don't know how wise they are. They probably are wise. 
But there's a little thing, and if you was raised up in the country any time at all, you've probably been acquainted with one of these. We used to go blackberry picking along about July, early July, mid-July. And there'd be a whole gang of young'uns, mom and daddy and all five of us young, snotty nose young'uns, going up Shoal Creek with buckets and pots and boxes and all kind of things, picking blackberries. And I'll tell you what, we'd come out the next day, we'd go to take a bath, and you take your clothes off, it looked like somebody shot you with a 410 shotgun with bird shot in it. The chiggers had took up residence all over you. So I don't know how, I know they're little, you can't see them. You, you guys looking like you don't know what a chigger is. You know what a chigger is? You, I, I don't think you know what a chigger is. Hey, you can't see him, but you know his presence. Yeah. Yeah, you can't see him. So with the Lord's help, I want to talk to you today about when chiggers come for dinner. There's a time in our life that there'll be a chigger get on you, and he's, he's looking for something to eat. He ain't worried about, he ain't worried about transportation. Hey, listen, he's, you are on the menu, and oftentimes they like rump roast. And they, they'll dig in, buddy, I'm telling you. So number one, if we look, uh, I, want, I want us to see the definition of a chigger. The definition, I looked it up, they're a blood-sucking mite. Their livelihood depends on the life of another. Hey, some call them bums, deadbeats, and hobos. A chigger is a parasite, and he is totally dependent upon the life of another. He can't support his own life. He can't survive for his own self, but he is totally dependent upon the life of another. Parasite. And uh, the synonyms of a parasite is a freeloader, bloodsucker, uh, and a sponger. Man, I've known some of them around here. I've known some of them. I looked up a definition of a parasite, and it's a person who is supported or seeks support from another without making an adequate return. I've known a bunch of them too. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Judas, I believe, was that away. Now, being an active part of the church for over 31 years, I've known some like that. And see, when, when, a, when a church has a big dinner on Saturday, all the church is invited. Oh, man, there'll be folks coming that ain't invited. And they'll have their plate. And I mean, they'll take home those take-home containers. I mean, boy, and boy. Sunday, well, on Saturday, well, they'll be loading their stuff up. And uh, you'll say, well, listen, I'd like to see you in church tomorrow. You come be with us. We'd love to have you. But on Sunday, they ain't nowhere to be found. But a chigger ain't that way. When you go to the blackberry briars and you start picking blackberries, you're going to realize his presence the next day. You'll be a clawing and a scratching. I mean, you. Have, I mean, them chickens will have you scratching in inappropriate places to scratch, especially in public. Yeah. Yes, sir. So the definition of a chigger, they're freeloaders. They'll sponge on you, sponge off of you. I don't want to be no free, uh, no a freeloader trying to sponge off of God and God's people and God's things. When chiggers come for dinner, we've seen the definition of a chigger, freeloader. Number two, we'll see the deeds of a chigger. They'll enter in through the fabric of your clothes. You hadn't invited them, he just comes on in anyway. He'll slide in there undetected and you just picking blackberries. I mean, you pick one, eat two. 
I mean, all of us, all that Allen bunch come out of the woods and down the briar, briar patch. When we'd get home, we'd have a big purple ring around our mouth where we'd been eating them blackbirds, eating more. <laughs> we had more in the belly than we did the bucket. Hey, they enter in undetected. They come on in anyway. They're looking for a free lunch, and that lunch is you. Tiggers can get on you, and you're not even aware of it. And then the Bible says that take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfiting, which means gluttony or overindulgence, and drunkenness, and the cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unaware. Sometimes we get to being, we just, uh, we just uh, eating and drinking and being happy. Hallelujah, like the, like the rich man that said, oh, I've had plenty. I'm going to tear down my barns and build greater barns. I'll eat and drink and be merry. God said, thou fool. Right hey, listen, you don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what tomorrow holds. Them old chiggers will get on you and he just starts chewing. I believe the biggest part about a chewer, about a chigger is his teeth. I mean, he's done bit down and got in there. there there's a microscopic little booger. And when you look at him, you're looking at his teeth. For as a snare. The Bible says it shall come upon all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Spiritual, old satanic chiggers getting all over everybody. Don't we live in a time that there's so much junk going on to get our minds off of the, our Creator and we got our minds on everything else I got to where I don't watch the news much anymore. I wind up getting in an ill spirit. I mean, them old satanic chiggers gets on me and I'm ready to, hey, I can watch the news and I'm ready to fight. That's not, hey, listen, I'd rather get in this thing right here and study God's holy and righteous word. Hey, because that'll feed your spirit and it won't feed your flesh. The chigger. He'll bite down into your flesh and he lives off the life blood of you. We've got enough trouble in this world trying to conquer the flesh and to defeat the flesh. Hey, I don't want to turn on the news and be scared to death by the news media. Be scared to death by the, by the health care industry. I don't want to be scared to death by all the things and how I'll be chewing my fingernails and, and uh, like Preacher Weaver says, eating tums and doing all these things. The deeds of a chigger. And listen, you'll get chiggers out in the weeds and the blackberry briars and the pine needles and the pine thickets. I know by experience I used to coon hunt. I'd sit down sometimes out in the woods in the pine needles. Lord have mercy. I'd be clawing the next day. And them little boogers is hard to get rid of. I mean, you know, you'll say, well, I can handle, I can handle a chigger. I asked my uncle one time, I said, Uncle Yates, what, what's good for a chigger? And he said, scratch it. He said, scratch it. I said, what's good for a chigger is itches. He said, scratch it. But I'm going to tell you something. You try to fix it yourself, you'll, you'll wind up and it'll get worse on you. It'll get infected. You're trying to take care of the situation on your own. Now, the Bible tells us in 1 John 2 to love not the world. Now, you get chiggers out in the weeds where you don't normally go. You go where they're at and they get on you. A lot of times when we get out in the world wallowing in the sinful things of this world, we'll get sinful chiggers on you that'll have a, a spiritual effect on you because they get out in your flesh and that old flesh will expose itself. Yeah. 
See, the Bible says in John 6, 63 that the, it's a spirit that quickens the flesh, profits nothing. Hey, yeah, I'm saved, but I still got flesh. And I can't go where I want to go. I used to be, I used to fight chickens. And I thought I was going to go look. Now, this is after I was saved now. I'm just going to go look. I ain't going to take part. And I went to look. And lo and behold, there was somebody in my Sunday school class that was there. God had him there to catch me, and he put me there to catch him. I'm glad God caught me, but he caught me before I left. But he set things up so when I got to the rooster fight, there's somebody in my Sunday school class. And it's like God said, you dummy. Now what's that man going to think about you? You up there teaching him the word of God and here you are in a place you ought not be. Boy, the Lord broke me, buddy. But I'm going to tell you, had not God caught me or let me get caught, that old, that old spirit that I used to live by could have entered in my flesh. And I'm going to tell you what, alcoholism, drinking, illicit sex, uh, all these sin perverted things that we're guilty of that the flesh takes us in, it's hard to get rid of. It's hard to get that out of your system just like a tigger. He gets embedded in the flesh and you just can't say, well, I'll just quit. Brother Rocky Law, the guys that comes to the rescue, man, they want to quit, but it's hard to quit. You can't quit within your own self. You got to have somebody that'll help you quit. And I'm going to tell you what, Jesus Christ will help you. You just can't do like you want to do the deeds of a chigger. The Bible says that the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's come and he'll do just that. If he can't get your soul, he'll try to dis destroy your testimony. The deeds of a chigger. He gets embedded for the flesh to get to the blood. Now the dangers of a chigger. They're so small, you can't see them on you. Just like the sins of the flesh. Well, you know, I love this guy. Some girls may say, I love this guy, and I think we'll just do this, that, the other that we shouldn't be doing. Or I love this girl, and we'll do this, that, or the other that we shouldn't be doing. I love him. And that causes me to do this, that, or the other. Well, I'm going to tell you what. You're inviting some chiggers into your flesh that's going to be real hard to get rid of. A little leaven. Leaven up the whole lump. See, our, tr our, our trouble starts when we start living in the flesh. Chiggers, I mean, you know, he's after the blood, but he'll get in that flesh. He's after the blood because that's where he lives. And, uh, but he'll chew down in that flesh, and he'll get embedded. I've had chiggers, and I'd go to scratching in inappropriate places. I wish I could have had it on my arm or my, on my knee or something. No, he won't get there. He'll irritate you. He'll get down there where you don't want him to be. Sin will get where you don't want it to be. You get out in this world and you dabble in this. Young people, don't let, the, don't let your friends entice you. Come join the crowd. Everybody's doing it. Don't let them do it. Say, no, by the help of God, I'm not going to do it. 
You get out in the world and you dabble in the sins of this world. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. Boy, when we do that, and you're looking at a professional sinner. Boy, I, I love that song, Sheltered by His Grace. Yeah. Hey, listen, we're all sheltered by His grace. Some of us more than others. But you just snuggle up to God and stay close to God and let God shelter you from the things of this this old satanic chiggers out in this world that's after to get down in your flesh. And when it does, it's hard to shake it off. Hard to get rid of it. Man, I know what I'm talking about. I guess hope, though. Our Savior can help you. In fact, he's the only one that can. See, the biggest, <clears throat> the biggest satanic uh, chigger that's been uh, introduced into our world in the last little while in my lifetime is the chigger of fear. Fear striking the people's hearts. You know, fear is the opposite of faith. Hey, listen, I want you to know, listen, I just have made up my mind I'm going to believe God. I'm going to trust in Him. Though, hey, though they slay me, yet will I trust Him. I'm going to trust Him and put my whole life yielded unto God. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of people, a lot of folks in my church that's not coming to church. They're scared. They're scared. And I'm going to tell you what, listen, you can read over there in Revelation 21, verse 8. The first one, it, it, in verse 7 it says that uh, you'll inherit all things, the Son of God, and I will be their God and they shall be my people, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable are not so. Hey, I don't want to be fearful. Now, you being careful is not, hey, but I don't want to be fearful. Yeah. Scared of the Lord. I, but I'm going to tell you, that old chigger will just keep on embedding. That fear, that fear will keep growing. You turn on the TV and all you hear is something to scare you and it keeps you scared. But get in this book and find that place. You get by him, praise God. And I tell you what, God will relieve you of that fear. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Hallelujah. The dangers of a chigger. My daddy used to, I'll share this and I'm almost through. My daddy used to, it's not the most inviting thing that you would want to do, but my daddy lived almost 102. He died September night, uh, in September of 2019 almost 102, and was active all about all of them years except maybe the last year that he lived. And he raised a lot of okra and corn and stuff like that. Early in the morning, he'd go down and he'd be picking uh, okra. <laughs> and, uh, and those mosquitoes, they ain't nothing but a stinking parasite too. They're looking for your life's blood. And them jokers would zing zing and boy they'd eat him up. I don't know. He must have had an odor that just boy they, they love my daddy. But he found a way to do it. He'd take a cloth that he had and he'd make him a necklace out of cloth but he'd saturate that cloth with spirits of turpentine. Man, you could smell him coming. You could smell him coming uh, 50 foot away. I smell daddy. He's around here somewhere. <laughs> he'd have it around his neck. He'd have them around his uh, arms. And he had things fixed. It. And then that scent would keep them drove away. We'd, and we'd do that when we'd go blackberry picking. After we got eat up a few times, you'll learn to try to do something. 
I mean, once you get help, you learn what to do. I'm going to tell you something. When those spiritual triggers, the things of this old flesh coming at you, getting, in your, getting involved in your flesh, embedded in your flesh, that flesh you got carrying around ain't saved. And it'll hurt your spiritual man. If you yield to the flesh, the just shall live by faith. Like Daddy done that spiritual serpentine. You take this spiritual book. Get in that book. Let God teach you how to live. Let God tell you where to stay away from. Let God teach you uh, everything that you need. And I promise you, you won't get those old satanic spiritual chiggers embedded down into your life. Now, and I'll close with this, and I'm going to hurry. Notice the depiction of a chigger. Now, a depiction is a picture of, a type of, or description. As much as I don't like chiggers, because they're aggravating, especially when you're in church and you got a chigger in an a unknown place that you don't want to share with people, and that joker goes to chewing. Oh, good Lord, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you want to scratch, but you don't want to be ugly. I don't like them because I've had them. I don't like sin in my life. Cause I've had it. I don't want to. I don't want to bring a reproach against my Lord and Savior. But as much as I don't like them, as aggravating as they are, you know, you and I are like an old chigger. You and I are like an old chigger. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I tell you what you do, you, you don't worry about that flesh of yours. That flesh will cause you a lot of pain and suffering, cause you family pain and suffering. There's people in this church that somebody they love dearly has walked away from God because what? Those satanic chigger get in their life and draw them away from God. They used to walk with the Lord. They used to talk to the Lord, but now they're off. Like the prodigal son. Amen. Eat up in chiggers of the flesh. Satanic chiggers. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We're a depiction of an old chigger. We have to have the blood of Jesus. We, our well-being is because of the blood of Christ. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Hallelujah. Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once, having obtained eternal Redemption for us. I want to be a spiritual chigger relying totally, completely on the blood of Jesus. And you can't get rid of those old worldly chiggers that gets on you, those old fleshly chiggers within yourself. You can scratch. You'll just make it worse. But I tell you what, folks, if you'll yield yourself to the Lord... Trust in Him. Man, I like that message. You find God's got a place for you. God's got a place for you. And you'll be surprised where God will put you in that place. First Kings 19, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he'd slain all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also. 
O oh Lord, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. When he saw that, he arose and went for his life, came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah. Young preachers, look what he did. He left his servant there. Biggest mistake he made that day. First thing the devil gets you is isolated. When you become a hermit, you're going down. God made us to have to have fellowship. And don't sit like King Kong on a throne. Well, come to me. Hey, go to them. You want encourage? Be an encourager. How many times you ever went to visit some old lady in the hospital? You went there to help her and she helped you. Hey, man. Boy, there's power in them and encouraging church members. Man, I tell you, I used to go, Charles Worley, man, and when I first started out, I'd go down there to get them to pray for me. Man, I'd go down there to watch that choir because there's a woman up there that sung and it's like a halo's around her head and she sung a smiling. Boy, she's a loving God. Makes a difference. You get all belly aching and all that pooch mouth mess. That's what Satan wants you to get. Because people need you as bad as you need them. They need your fellowship. You don't just need theirs. They need yours. Hey, we need a soulmate. We need some men can have praise. God encourage us. Well, I better get on with this. He himself went a day's journey in the wilderness, came and sat down under a juniper tree. He requested for himself that he might die, and he said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my fathers. I'm going to talk to you about Elijah losing his confidence. When a man loses his confidence, Brother Bobby, pray for us, will you? Yes, Lord. God, we love you today. Oh, God, strengthen us with might in our inner man. Dear God, may we, God, be filled with the knowledge of your will. All wisdom, spiritual understanding. Amen. Loss of confidence. Here in 1 Kings 19, we see that Elijah lost his confidence. What happens when you lose your confidence? You lose your courage. That's what happened to him. Here's the boldest man on earth, and he wilts in front of a woman. Why? He lost his confidence, and there's a reason he did. When you lose your confidence, you lose your courage. When you lose your courage, you lose your conviction. When you lose your conviction, you lose your commitment. When you lose your commitment, you lose your consecration. What happened to Elijah? It happened in the secret place. It happened in his heart. He got out of heart. He got discouraged. Over what? He got discouraged over results. That's what got him. Results. And results-oriented ministry will always be a ministry of discouragement. Your joy can't be in numbers and results. It's got to be in God. Sometimes they'll love you. Sometimes they'll hate you. But thank God, God's always there. Fine. You delight in God. You joy in God. Not in handshakes, not in applause, and not in people. We do what we do for Christ. Then we do what we do for people. These preachers been in this thing. Brother Barry, you've been in this thing a long time. There ain't nobody in this world we do this for but him. Boy, that's right. But when you love God, you love God's people. You know what? These people in life, you'll be good to. I've had men be good to me because who my daddy was. And we're good to people because who they belong to. And if God thinks enough of them to save them, we ought to love them too. Amen. Elijah lost confidence in himself. That's what happened to him. He lost confidence in the ministry. He lost confidence in the people. And he ultimately lost confidence in God. What happened to him? He, got, he suffered a loss of perspective. You see, the problem with Elijah is he's looking through the eyes of results and not through the eyes of truth. Truth is like seed. It takes time for it to grow. There are no instant church building. The ministry, you've got to be long-term. Cast your bread on the water. 
If you stay at it long enough, you'll see the ships come back in from Africa and India and around the world bring them out goods because you sent something out. You can't withdraw from the bank if you ain't made an investment. A lot of people ain't got no praying power because they ain't never made no investment. Then they come to make a withdrawal and ain't got nothing there. Hey, Amen, I'm talking about a life of faithfulness. Notice this. The work of the Lord is not Elijah's work. They, listen, up to this point, Jezebel, anybody on Mount Carmel, any failure there was not Elijah's fault. No. There's not one thing that Elijah didn't do that God told him to do. Notice this right quick. He is victorious. No matter what the people do, he obeyed God, and obedience to God is victory in itself. You've got to get that. Noah, what are your results? Not much, but I obeyed God. I found my satisfaction in God. I got my family on the ark. We're here today because of him. Didn't look like it done much, but I did what he told me to. He didn't look like I accomplished much, but I did what he told me to. Hey, Enoch, how successful are you? I did what he told me to do. I preach what he told me to. I can't save anybody. I can't make anybody love God, serve God, but I did what God told me to do. That's the victory. The victory is the obedience. Learn to find your satisfaction in God's will and doing God's will. Discouragement leads to depression. Depression leads to despair. Despair leads to defeat. And defeat leads to disaster. He had been protected, provided for, for three and one half years. Next to Moses, Elijah saw more than any man of the Old Testament. What he saw, most of it was in eight hours. I mean, he's seen God rock that part of the world. He saw the way God built faith in the life of Elijah. Elijah had to trust God for his physical daily needs. That's why you got deputation for missionaries. That's why you got preachers uh, giving themselves to the ministry, sometimes by vocational. What they're doing, they're learning to trust God for their daily needs. And that starts building faith. God is feeding Elijah by an unclean bird. God had to change the nature of that raven for him to get the food. Yeah. Raven means ravenous. I believe they went and got that meat off the table of Ahab and every day, two times a day, he had bread and meat. What's that called? It's called a sandwich. Amen. Yeah. He just didn't have any mayonnaise. Yeah. Where does God take him next? He takes him to the, up there for a widow woman. Starvation and her son about to eat their last meal and she gave him a cake first and he saw God provide for him in the house of a Gentile dog under the nose of Jezebel's daddy and he never found him they went hunt for Ahab or for Elijah all around that part of the country making kingdoms, taking affidavit that they were not hiding him and using him in warfare against Israel to cut the water off. He was 22 miles from Ahab to start with and he's right under the nose of Jezebel's daddy, the king, up there in that part of the country. What's God do? Then God lets that boy die. Then Elijah sees resurrection power. Boy, he's getting ready now to stand on Mount Carmel. But he goes to Ahab and he requests a showdown between the gods. It's what the showdown between 450 prophets of Baal and Elijah. It is a showdown between the devil and God. David and Goliath was a showdown between the gods. Amen. Here's Elijah. Saw all that. And he lets one reprobate woman with empty threats undo what God had done in his heart for his entire life. No scripture manifests in a man's life a greater victory than those eight hours or whatever they were on Mount Carmel. 
Notice this. A lack of perspective. Elijah was not qualified to pass judgment on what he had done. You can't judge anything before the time. No. Brothers, that my water number two there? <laughs> you, you don't know what you've done. You don't know the seed you've sown. You don't know the blessing you've been. You're not qualified to judge if you're a failure. Only God knows that. Elijah, as great as he was, he didn't know about the 7,000 had not bowed the knee to Baal. He didn't know what it did for that little old remnant to see a man stand up by himself and take on the enemy and take on the false prophets of Baal. It charged the hearts of the people of God. He didn't know the impact he was having in the south, down there in Judah. I never have understood. Here is Ahab Jezebel. They never had a decent king the whole time in Israel, northern Israel, and God sent Elijah and Elisha to the best he had to preach and try to plow on that hard, rocky ground. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Elijah didn't know the impact he's going to have on history. He didn't know that on the Mount of Transfiguration, hallelujah, that Elijah and Moses, that Elijah will represent the prophets and God passed up Samuel and God passed up Jeremiah and God passed up Isaiah and God put Elijah on our Mount of Transfiguration. He didn't know the impact he is going to have on history. You don't know the impact you're going to have on one person. I believe some churches are raised up by God sometimes to have a great influence on one person. There's an old man in his 70s, ministry coming to a close, nothing happening. The deacons called him in, broke his heart, and said, Brother, there's just nothing moving around here. And we just sort of felt like maybe it's time you move on. And the old man said, What about little Bobby? He said, little Bobby, that's a little eight or nine-year-old redhead, freckle-faced boy. He said, well, little Bobby got saved in our last revival. They broke the old man's heart. Guess who got the last life there? Little Bobby grew up to be Robert Moffat. <laughs> hey, don't misjudge a day of small things. Everything big was once small. Praise God. Let God promote you. Let God encourage you. The main thing are you obeying. What God have you do? You know what the Bible tells us? John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. What not Elijah reincarnated? They had the same spirit, same preaching power. Did you know that I got a man, I gotta hurry. Did you know that Elijah saw all those miracles? And Elisha double it. Do you know that John the Baptist didn't do one miracle? But it come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Right. He's forerunner. Uh, old John the Baptist is out there by the Jordan River. And God's had drawn him by the tens of thousands. Out in that heat. That's the power of God. God's had drawn him out there. Old John the Baptist is preaching to them like leather lungs, George Whitfield, and a multitude of them were prepared right there for Pentecost and the days after. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You can't, and, and by the way, we talk about Elijah. Yeah, they something about them two witnesses. Hey, if they gone, one of them's gonna come in the spirit of Elijah and probably Moses, whatever that is, and I wouldn't argue with 10 seconds because I don't know it all and you don't either. So the 7,000 made up the remnant that repented. The representatives of the nation had acknowledged God. That day, they found out who had stopped the rain, who cut it off. And they found out who could turn her on that day. And when they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. It was because they understood that day that God had fulfilled the Old Testament verse, how if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face in turn from their wicked ways. God said in the book of Deuteronomy, 28 verse 24 he would judge his people by withholding the rain if they forsook him what did Elijah say on the hills of all that power he said I'm not better than my fathers he said my fathers 
could not turn this crowd back to God and I can't either. Well, if God didn't, he sure can't. If God doesn't touch the heart of your people, you sure can't. A lot of times what a ministry is, is God bringing you people and raising up people around you that's got a heart for you that you can't have, you can't lead people that will not follow you and sometimes that takes a while to get some real followers. Elijah's day, he saw God honored, he saw God vindicate him like no man ever has. Comes down after God. God could have embarrassed him publicly. But they'd have killed him. But if he hadn't produced a rain, his head would have been cut off. Amen. Boy, that's right. God vindicated him. He, they, they, those old false prophets of Baal up there uh, cutting themselves and screaming and hollering and jumping up and down. Oh, Elijah does repair the altar. Put the sacrifice on the altar. Took three loads of water. But that took a while and watered that thing down and God sucked up the water, the sacrifice, and the rocks and the dust. That fire fell from heaven. How'd you like for God to vindicate you like that? Are you seeing human nature here? Are you seeing how vulnerable we are to depression and demons and emotion on the hills of our greatest day can come our greatest conflict? Notice this. Brother Doug, if I've ever seen a public beatdown and an absolute humiliation publicly of the devil, it was on Mount Carmel. The only other place he is humiliated more is Mount Calvary. Boy, at Mount Carmel, I'm telling you, God, through Elijah, by God's power, I mean, had a beatdown of victory unheard of and has never been repeated to this day. The most powerful day of his life. The most powerful day of any man's life almost. And he wanted to quit at the end of the day because one woman didn't get saved. You know what Elijah said? God, if you'll send the fire. God, if you'll send the rain. God, if you do enough miracles, they'll believe. And that's a lie. You're not saved by miracles. You're saved by the preaching of the gospel. You're saved by faith in Christ, not in miracles. You can say all you want to. I'll tell you one thing. It's like hellfire preaching. Hellfire preaching might wake you up, but it won't save you. Christ saves you. Judgment's never brought any man to God. Judgment wakes you up. And then the goodness of God. Amen. Boy, you ought to go to hell. Oh, God ought to go to hell, but you don't have to. And God will show you Christ, and that's what leads you to repentance. Hey, man. Hey, when I look at Elijah, I say, my God. Boy, I better be careful, or something worse than this could happen to me. You know what his problem was? He thought he's a disappointment to God, he thought he let God down. He thought he let the people down. He thought that he let his forefathers down. He let his family down. He let himself down. All because he didn't win Jezebel. Dear man, I wouldn't, I, I, there ain't no need to argue with me. I wouldn't argue with you five seconds. I'll just let you just have your own opinion because I got mine. You can't win people literally to Christ. You can witness to people. You cannot put that word in a man's heart. You cannot open his eyes. You cannot emancipate his will. You cannot set him free. All we can do is tell others what Christ done for us and sow that seed. And unless the drawing power of God is present, they can't be saved. Christ said, no man can come to me except my Father who sent me. Draw him. You got to be drawn. I was talking to Dr. Phil over here. Dr. Phil got saved, 37, Brother Phil. So I was inquiring. I love people's testimony. But I love, listen to me. Who, who's that dear brother just preaching from me? What's your name, huh? Jesse. Hey, man, David's son of Jesse. Jesse. You know what I like about testimonies? 
Boy, that day you get converted. I never shall forget the day. But I want to hear the God stuff that got you to that day. If you want to shout, if you want to glorify God, get in all that God stuff that got you to that day. Brother Jesse told me he'd never seen Christ in his life, didn't even know he was lost. There ain't no man can convince you you're lost, they can tell you you are, but you'll never see it till God shows you that you're lost. So how's Elijah going to save Jezebel? She's reprobated. Dear people, everybody ain't going to get saved. Some people are reprobated. Some, hey, what about Christ's day? Let's get on that and i got to hurry. You believe Christ's God in the flesh? If you don't, you ain't saved. He is all man, all God. And I'll tell you what the all man, all God did. He went and preached to the multitude of tens of thousands. How many did he have? At the end of his ministry, 500. He appeared to 500. Christ only appeared to believers after the resurrection. He appeared to 500, and there's 120 in the upper room. And he preached to hundreds of thousands, probably. God preaching. Do you think he said down at the end of the day, I'm a failure? I didn't win them. Have you lost your mind? Get a burden for what God's got a burden for. Get, hey, spread the gospel, but try to find those that God gives you a burden for. Now, I'm not against giving it to everybody. I believe, I believe Christ died for all men. Don't you mishear what I'm saying. But I don't believe all men's going to be saved, and I don't believe God deals with all men the same way. Boy, they say, God gets determined. He knows how to persuade a man. He knows how to get that man. That's what prayer does. That's what preaching does. We cooperate with him. Baal was exposed as a fraud. So what's happening here? Elijah goes up on the top, at the top of Mount Carmel and he prays. God's done told him it's going to rain, but it ain't going to rain till he prays. Now that's the mystery of prayer. And when you figure that one out, let me know the answer. He goes up there and prays and he sends his servant. His servant comes back, that's one. He sends him seven more times, that's eight. Eight times. That servant went to try to find evidence that the rain was coming. And the last time, he saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. He knew that was a hand of God. Oh, Elijah heard that. He told Ahab to get down. Uh, he had already heard an abundance of rain. He heard it rain before he prayed. God doesn't shut him. It's going to rain. And he prayed, and he prayed to victory. He prayed to the answer was first in his heart. Then he prayed till it was in his hand. And I stole that from Adrian Rogers who stole that from Manly Beasley. Probably. So I don't like them. We'll forget about it. Most people here don't even know who I'm talking about. Somebody help you don't think y'all give them credit. No, I ain't it quiet in here. Does that not dot your eye and cross your teeth? You have got to prove something I do. Amen. Amen. You better get off this knuckleheaded stuff. You better let God use men to help you. Amen. Or your little circle's going to get small. All you're doing is talking back to yourself. God. Elijah on Mount Carmel. The person and all that went on. He outrun. Can you imagine this? Hey, you have ain't a couple horses left in the land. Hey, you have got the royal chariot. He's got the fastest horses there is. And Elijah outruns uh, 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 Ahab, that royal chariot, about 20 miles. Man, you talk about praise God. I bet the French would want to test it his blood a thousand times. Yeah. Performance enhancing drugs. Yeah. He got to Jezreel, brother Doug. He just knew. Ahab's going to come in there and repent. Hey, I'm just going to walk in the palace and say, Jezebel, the God of my father is just God. He, sent, he just sent the rain. He's the one that shut up the heavens. And she said, you boy, get up here, set out. I'm going to take care of that, Elijah. Are you listening? 
Some old hard-hearted person, they ain't going to believe nothing because they choose not to believe. She threatened old Elijah's life that day. I'm going to tell you something. It's all a big bluff. That's all it was. It was a big bluff. If she could have killed him, she would have. If Elijah could have killed him, he would have. I'll tell you, right when God's got all the victory, Elijah backs down and throws victory in the jaws of defeat. He had the victory. He had it. And because she didn't get saved, he's going to run from the church. One person against him, he's going to run, run from the church. He's got to go on down the road. One person opposed him, I'm going to quit. God ain't killed that person yet. I'm going to quit. Oh, you know what I'm saying. Jezebel is terrified of Elijah, and he flees at her threat when he's got her pinned and against the ropes, and he let her up. He let her off the hook. Well, let's get past that to the end of this thing. You know why she's so adamant? Tell you what, Brother Doug, because she knows she's just been exposed. Bell did not stop the rain, and Bell couldn't turn the water on, and she's been killing God's prophets. And those people, listen to me now, those men on Mount Carmel that turned on those prophets of Baal, public sentiment is going to turn against her in a hurry if she don't get Elijah out of the land. She don't get that preacher shut down. She can't save face. That's what these threats are about, her saving face. Now, dear man, I don't know how in the world all this happened before sundown. But they killed 450 prophets of Baal. Elijah stood there. Do you think for a second he killed all of them by himself? No. Not unless he liked Samson and stacked them up like cordwood and they come at him, he like a helicopter just a cutting them down, stacking them up. If he killed 450 prophets of Baal, that means a bunch of them Israeli men helped him. And that means they backed down Ahab's army. And they wouldn't think Ahab could do about it because the whole tide had turned. And Jezebel knew that. The day, hey, Elijah runs from the ministry when all those people had just cried his God. And they needed him to be there to encourage. They needed him right now more than they ever needed him. And he let one person that didn't get saved because he just knew she would. You better watch this stuff you think God shows you. You better know it's God. Here's how the devil, I'm going to tell you something about prayer and i got to quit. I'm going to tell you something about prayer. God will put in your heart, I'm going to save your boy. Listen. And the devil steps right up and says he's going to do it Sunday. And you get on the phone and you start calling people. God's promised me he's going to save my boy. And he's going to do it Sunday. And God did promise you he's going to save your boy. But then the devil give you a time frame and you lose. You get egg on your face and you quit God because you're so embarrassed. That's a devil. So Elijah runs right quick. Many pastors have left good churches because of the opposition of one or two families. Results oriented, fear oriented. Elijah actually believed such a demonstration of God's power would save them all. But what he didn't understand, many are called, many are welcome, but they ain't many get saved. Elijah lost perspective, he lost purpose right quick. His heart was on results and not the Lord. You know why? He worshiped the ministry and not the Lord. He loved the work, but he lost his devotional life with God. He lost the purpose. He's God's spokesman. And when you've obeyed God, then you leave the results to God. We say that. Why don't we believe it? When Elijah lost confidence in himself, he lost confidence in God. Why would you ever blame yourself for things only God can do? God, they won't come back to church Sunday night. We're beating, banging, blasting, but they ain't neither. Go and bleed bleed out on the carpet on Sunday morning and they ain't coming back Sunday night. Get over that stuff. Feed the sheep. Quit butting heads with goats. God don't turn their heart, they ain't coming. You can intimidate all you want to. It ain't their heart. 
Man don't come to the table hungry, he ain't gonna eat. If he ain't got an appetite, he ain't gonna eat. When Elijah lost confidence, he lost the desire for ministry. The hope of being used. He became a hermit. He lost his passion for God's ministry. Some people lose confidence because of placement. They stay defeated. Now, I heard of a man who got converted. Just wild for God. And he said, well, when he's a Sunday school teacher, he ain't even been saved six weeks or six months. He said, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Brother Bobby, they put him in adult Sunday school class, had 42. In a month, he had 32. In two months, he had 22. He finally got down to one man. And that one man come to him and said, you know, I, I can't even be here all the time myself. And he goes to the pastor and quit. Why? Because he volunteered for something that God never sent him to do. And a lot of people in your church, the coach calls the position of the players. The coach does. And the coach has to set some down. And the coach is in charge of who plays and where they play. And the coach is Christ and the pastor's assistant coach that obeys the orders of the coach. You better watch his volunteering, folks. I thank God for volunteers, but you better know that God's equipped you to do it. Amen. Praise the Lord, ain't God good. I heard of an old pastor I told this the other morning. Jubilee. Heard of a pastor. He was up in Canada. Hard ground. Hard ground. Boy, it's hard now too. And he stayed up there ministering for many years. He didn't have a big church. Boy raised enemy. Boy become a great worldwide known preacher. But daddy never seen much results. That, that boy said, I never remember a day that my daddy didn't spend at least 45 minutes in prayer and Bible study. He said, every day. I asked him one day, I said, Dad, how do you keep doing this? It got so bad, they brought some missionaries in from Africa. They're going to come up there and win everybody to God and fill these churches up. They got up there and hit the same wall he been hitting. They got discouraged in a few weeks, they go. Huh? He said, Dad, how'd you do it? He said, because one day, I was reading the book of Corinthians. Paul had been beaten, banged on, and afflicted, and persecuted. And he is tired of the whippings. Opposition come to him in Corinth. He's going to run. God said, son, don't go. I'm going to protect you. I've got many people in this city. And he said, when God sent me up here, he let me know there's some people up here for me to reach. And that's why I've stayed with him. There ain't nothing like God giving the increase. You can go visiting on Saturday for two hours, not a person will come to church, but five will show up you never even met. God honors the effort. God honors the effort. And you can preach to people you're blue in the face, all of a sudden one Sunday, bam, 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 they see it. I ain't never seen a preacher. I see it now. I see him. And God converts them. And we all rejoice in the what God has done. If you'll quit taking the credit for what God does and give God all the glory, then you can bear the heartbreak when things ain't happening. I've witnessed and preached to a lot of people, but I've never won anybody. Holy Ghost wins them. He shoots us to witness to them. That's right. <laughs> oh, dear God, help us to be content. In the Lord. That don't mean we don't have a burden. People leave the church lost. It grieves me to death. Right. What I used to do, what I used to do when I first started preaching revivals, I'd go pray half the night or all night. If people didn't get saved, then I'd about kill myself. You know why? I won't have revival. That church could care less. A lot of times they didn't even get nobody in there lost. Ain't been no praying done. I can't have revival for them. I can't believe for them. I can't seek God for them. I ain't seeking for myself. And beg God to help them and turn their hearts to him. But you got to get to the point. God, you're in charge. Show me what to do. Show me what to preach. Give me the power to do it. You know what you need to pray? God, give me some people that will love me. Brother John, I, you know I wire this statement out. You'll never receive the message if you don't receive the messenger. 
First thing you pray, you go to church you've never been to. God help them people like me. If they don't like you, they won't receive what you say. God help me to find my crowd. Help me to find my people. Help me to run with my crowd, my preacher friends. Help me to find the people you want me to minister to. Because I don't want to waste my time on a bunch of dead heads and hardwood or uh, rocks and stones. I want to help somebody that wants it. Amen. 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 Oh, Lord. Do it for your name's sake. And every time God saves somebody, give him all the glory. Every time God anoints you to preach, give him all the glory. Every time, hey, how you done? Better than I deserve. God's blessing more than I ever deserve. Brother Pastor, I love you. Hallelujah. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.